So the title was initially to be about um, thyroid problems in Turner syndrome, but I want to put this in the context of what, when the thyroid goes bad in someone with Turner syndrome, it's part of a bigger picture that includes many other conditions, and I want you to be aware of how they're related. These are things that we call autoimmune disorders, and see the, see the context that that, um, that that happens in. Um, so the, uh, you may have seen this before. This is the Monroe Carroll Junior Children's Hospital where, where I work, where I've headquartered. Um, and uh, I welcome those of you who are new to Nashville to uh, Music City. So I have no disclosures to make, no financial disclosures. I don't get rich doing this. But I do... <laughs> I do want to uh, disclose my appreciation to you for having me here, uh, through, and, and, and in particular to the Weirs. Everybody knows Sean and Taya. Uh, they've taught me a ton about Turner syndrome over the years. Uh, the, the part of it that I don't get to see in the office, and um, it's been they've been a huge help to me as a resource to other families when when babies come into the world and the families are you know surprised and they don't know quite what to make of this. The Weirs have been there for them, so thank you to them in particular. Uh, but again, thanks to all of you for being here. So um, I just want to, so there's this document that many of you know, there's clinical practice guidelines for care of girls and women with Turner syndrome. And one of their guidelines, it's got multiple things, you, you, know, you know about checking the hearts and the kidneys. It says that uh, girls and women with Turner syndrome, they recommend testing of thyroid function at diagnosis and annually thereafter. So something's up with the thyroid. Uh, actually, let me take a quick poll. Does, in, your, just in your family, you don't have to say whether it's you, are there people with thyroid problems? Oh, oops. okay. I'm preaching to the choir here. All right. So, so it's this, this is something you know about. Um, so the goals of this talk are to, to talk to you about the risk of, to understand the risk of developing thyroid disease and Turner syndrome, a little bit about the symptoms, the treatment, and the consequences. Where, where, what does this, what's the problem with thyroid? But then also put thyroid, hypothyroidism, which is by far the most common thyroid problem, into the context of autoimmune diseases. Turner women are more prone to develop autoimmune conditions, and th thyroid is just one of them. So I want to show you what the other ones are, and in particular, talk to you just at the very end, a little glimpse of what we're doing in preventing what used to be called juvenile diabetes, type 1 diabetes, which is an autoimmune disease that is, I think, eight times more common in women with Turner syndrome than in the general population, um, in order that you kind of see where, where we're going to, to develop a way to prevent it from actually occurring. So let's move on. One, one comment. Everybody's going to ask me this. Hypothyroidism does not make anybody fat. That's every, your friends will say that when we get referred overweight children, it's like the parents are just dying for us to find a thyroid problem because that's going to cure it. It can make you puffy. I'll show you why. And fat, no. So let's, we'll get past that one. Don't ask me that question. So how does the, how does the thyroid gland work and how is it regulated? So I'm, I'm showing you here. That's, that's a, it's kind of hard to see, I'm sure, a lady. But right there in the neck is the thyroid gland. And these are the hormones, the two major hormones, T3 and T4, that it makes. And I'm comparing this to a thermostat and a furnace, right? So when we do testing for somebody's thyroid function, we measure a, a couple of things. And let me just kind of run through this. The brain makes a hormone called TSH uh, regulating hormone, TSH releasing hormone. It's got actually a longer name, but that's close enough. And then the pituitary gland here makes this thing called thyroid stimulating hormone. So that's kind of like the stimulator of the thyroid. And it come, when it hits the thyroid, it goes into the blood. When it hits the thyroid, it makes it release more thyroid hormone. But then when the thyroid hormone levels go up in the blood, there's this thing we call a feedback loop, right? So it goes back to the pituitary and the hypothalamus. Those are little minuses, those two red dots there. And it shuts things off. So it's, it's a little bit like a furnace. You set a temperature on your thermostat. You tell it you want it to be 72. If it's colder than 72, it sends basically an electric signal down to the furnace. The furnace heats up. Once it, it, the air in the room hits the desired temperature, it feeds back and it shuts it off. It's just on or off, on or off. And it's a little bit how the thyroid works. So that when your thyroid becomes underactive, which is the predominant thing that happens in Turner syndrome, you, these levels start to go down in the blood. 
the feedback is broken and the TSH goes up. So the number, we're gonna, we'll talk about this more, but the TSH is the number one way we measure whether someone's thyroid is in pretty good shape because it should be in the normal range. If it starts to climb high, that usually means that the thyroid is uh, underactive uh, and needs, needs some help. And I'll show you in a little bit too, conversely, when the thyroid gets overactive, which is a, also more common in women with Turner syndrome, but, but much less so than underactive, what happens is there's too much of these hormones, there's that feedback loop, so it goes off and shuts off the TSH, so TSH levels are low, thyroid hormones are high in hyperthyroid, overactive thyroid. In hypothyroidism, it's the opposite. Thyroid hormones are low, TSH goes up. Okay, so I think I just said what this slide shows. If you do a blood test where somebody has an underactive thyroid, the level of T4 or T3 goes down, TSH goes up, and also we measure commonly the presence of these antithyroid antibodies. Not every time you test someone, but once you've established that they're there, that confirms that what's going on in that patient is that the immune system is attacking the thyroid. Uh, and, that, and, and then the, when you examine them, there's a lot of things. I'll, again, I'll show you some pictures. One of the things that happens when the thyroid is underactive, the TSH goes up and the thyroid gets bigger. It swells, and you get what's called a goiter. All right. Now, very rarely, women with Turner syndrome can develop Graves' disease. It's just the opposite. This was a guy named Graves. It doesn't mean you have, like, one foot in the grave. It's just an overactive thyroid where the T4 is high, the thyroid hormone, the TSH becomes low, and there are also some different antibodies present in the blood that, um, that uh, uh, we can measure. Okay. Oh, sorry, that's me. Sorry. <laughs> So Dr. Najjar is covering, I'm on call, and she covered me for me for an hour, and that's just her saying she's on, so that's, that's good. Thank you. Um, all right, so here's a goiter. I have never seen one like this. All right, so that's, that's the, the far extreme of this. This is what you see in, often in Africa, where there's really, really severe iodine deficiency. That's not something we deal with here very much at all. I've seen this, I mean, not that size goiter, but I've seen this in people who have moved here from Africa who are iodine deficient, and the treatment for that is really easy. They just have to take some iodine supplements for a while. Our food has iodine in it. So that's, that's an ex extreme goiter. All right. Now, this is a more typical goiter right here. So this is a girl. Can you, well, so I hope you can see back there that there's this kind of swelling there. The thyroid is shaped, and I'll show you actually a picture of one re after it's been removed from someone so you can kind of see what its shape is like, but it's like, almost like a butterfly, but let's just say it's like a bow tie. Um, and uh, there's a, a, a lobe on the right side and the left side. The, the right side, for those of you who are up close, you might be able to see that this side is a little more swollen than that side. And it's, that's typically what happens. That's often bigger. It has a very, very peculiar, not peculiar, very distinctive feel when you, when you touch it uh, in, in, um, when there's autoimmune damage to the thyroid being done. Uh, when there's when there's inflammation in the thyroid, but that's a more typical goiter that you'll see. But that's the kind of thing you'll see, it, you know, across the room on somebody. If you, if you once you've seen a few of them, if you've had one yourself, you'll pick that up on somebody else. I guarantee you. Now we do other tests sometimes, and I'm not going uh, to to uh, kind of go into this too much. We sometimes do tests to look at how active the thyroid is when we suspect that it's hyperactive. We can give tracer very small doses of radioactive iodine. We can measure how much iodine is uptaken by the, taken up by the gland. We can take pictures of the thyroid after it's been exposed to radioactive iodine. That just kind of shows you whether, in fact, I'll show you a picture of one of these scans. We can do ultrasounds. We do biopsies sometimes, not very often, but PET scans and CAT scans. And the bone age has nothing to do with the thyroid, but bone age is a thing we do a lot in children. It's a measure, it's an x-ray of their left hand. It gives us an idea of how mature the skeleton is. And what we find in someone who's hypothyroid is that their skeleton development is very immature. So they might be six years old and they've got the, the bone age or the bone development of a four-year-old. And that's, that's a delay in that. And I'll, I think the next slide actually shows a couple of these things. So this is, this is a thyroid. So there's somebody who's been given some radioactive iodine. They take a picture with a it's not an actual regular camera, but that detects the radioactivity. There's a normal thyroid, but over here, you see in that person's thyroid, there's this big hole in it, and that's thyroid tissue, but it's not taking up iodine, and that's what we call a cold nodule. 
Sometimes that needs to be investigated for thyroid cancer. So when you, when you find nodules in someone's thyroid, someone's thyroid, you might have an I-131 scan or sometimes a technesium scan. Another way we do this uh, is an ultrasound. So there's thyroid tissue. And I want to give you just the, again, it's pretty hard to see from the back, but it looks like clouds in there, and it's kind of irregular. And that is classic for uh, the Hashimoto's thyroiditis, the inflammation of the thyroid, because you get these little bumps in there that are from uh, uh, lymph cells making, little, making their homes in here. And it, the, the ultrasonographers, the people who read these, describe this as diffusely and regularly heterogeneous, meaning everywhere it's kind of not the same. It's, kind of, it's not the same texture all the way through. But there are no nodules there. It's, Nodules you can pick up, but see, there's a nodule that you pick up with an iodine scan. Now, this is an actual thyroid. I don't want to gross you out, but you can see it's bumpy. And when someone has Hashimoto's thyroiditis, that's what your gland looks like. And when I can feel it, when I feel it, I, there's just a, a texture to that you can't miss. One last thing, and then no more gross pictures, I promise. <laughs> so there's a drawing of a thyroid, uh, the right lobe, the left lobe, it's from the patient's side. Right in the middle there, there is a little, a little part of the thyroid that normally is very small. You can see in this person, it goes way up quite high. Normally, it's a little bump that you can't feel. And that's called the pyramidal lobe. And here, here's, here's somebody's thyroid where that was removed. You can see it's quite strikingly big, and that's classic for Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So when somebody who kind of is experienced in, in feeling these kinds of glands. The, I mean, the first thing I look at is how, how big they are. Do I feel any nodules? Because that would make me worry about big nodules, worry about cancer or something else. Can I feel a pyramidal lobe? And that, that's always kind of a very reassuring thing that this is probably Hashimoto's. What causes it to grow well, I don't know why. It's, it's lymphoid tissue. It's, it's, for, for some reason, it's, maybe it's less constrained. It's, normally, it's just a little bump like that. It's, maybe it's less constrained than if you developed it in, in the rest of the gland. It just kind of moves up. I don't know why. I don't know why. In the, in the um, 1800s, early 20th century, this used to be called the Delphian node, like, Del, like the oracle at Delphi, you know, where ancient Greeks used to go to, to find out what was going to happen to them in their life. And the reason it was called the Delphian node was that, it, that people thought it, it predicted cancer in the thyroid. It's definitely not a cancer thing. It's an autoimmune autoimmune thing, which I think leads me to this, this, oh no, not quite yet, discussion of what autoimmunity is. But first, so I remember I told you hypothyroidism can make you puffy, but not fat. Here's a picture of a young guy before treatment, hypothyroid, classic hypothyroid. Look, look how puffy that face is, and kind of the squinty little eyes, and the same guy after treatment. Uh, this is not my patient, so I can't tell you how many months went by, but it does not take years and years for that to happen. And even more, uh, striking, and I, I hope this shows. This is the same girl. These are school pictures of a young girl, six, seven, six, eight, ten, eleven, twelve, and fourteen years. Now, can anybody in the front row here say when, when was she diagnosed with hypothyroidism and treated? Right in here. Look at that face there. Somewhere in here, and there she is at fourteen. You can see though, slowly her cheeks are getting more puffy. Her eyelids look puffy. Look at that. Here, the same thing. Somewhere in here is when she was treated. That's classic. That's classic. You see this at any age, the puffiness. You also get this in your... So this is called myxedema. It's kind of a, a, a thick protein kind of uh, fluid that uh, infiltrates the skin. You see it in your ankles. Uh, that's called pretibial myxedema. You can also get it in your vocal cords. And when it happens in the vocal cords, you get a very hoarse voice, and that's part of the... That what goes on when you're developing um, hypothyroidism. So some people with hypothyroidism have a very distinctly husky voice. I'll flip to something that's totally unrelated. There's a condition that we, is, we see in pediatrics called congenital hypothyroidism. It's not this. And Turner girls are not more, Turner babies are not more prone to this than anyone else. But these are kids born without a thyroid. And the hallmark of those kids, if they're not picked up early, and diagnosed early, which we do in newborn screening program, you know, the heel stick uh, blood test, is that they have a very hoarse cry because their vocal cords are filled with the same goopy stuff that makes your face puffy and your ankles and other parts. You can get mixed edema in your heart. It can, it can accumulate in your ears, uh, in, the middle, in your middle ear, which can affect your hearing. 
And, you know, Turner girls have enough issues with hearing. That's not something they need to deal with, but that's one issue. Now, here's another thing. that you, you guys know this about using growth hormone. This is not about growth hormone. This is about hypothyroidism. All children, so this is not a, a child with, with, um, with Turner syndrome. This is a, a, a girl. But you can see here on the growth chart at age uh, four, she's at just below the 50th percentile right there. And you can see what happens is she's slowly falling further and further away from the, from the graph. This, this was a patient that a, a friend of mine uh, diagnosed. I, I wouldn't be proud to say if I was the doctor following this kid because it looks like she had growth failure until she was like 12 years old before somebody actually figured out it was her thyroid that was causing the problem. And then you can see what happens here. She has this rapid recovery of her, um, of her height. So, so, so she ends up at the end somewhere just above the 10th percentile, or just below the, sorry, a little bit below the 10th percentile. Now, the problem is that dot right there is where her parents' height would suggest she ought to have been. So what we know with hypothyroidism in children, if you diagnose it too late, you can get a good response and have them grow faster, but you probably lose some height uh, as compared to what you would have been if somebody had picked this up much earlier and, and treated it earlier. In fact, that was the title of the paper that, that uh, Dr. Rivkes wrote about this, and he actually predicted how much height you lose for every year that you delay in diagnosing hypothyroidism. So that makes sense in a group like girls with Turner syndrome that from day one they have their thyroid tested and at least every year thereafter so that this kind of stuff doesn't happen because there's enough issues already with growth in girls with Turner syndrome. Growth hormone won't overcome this. If your thyroid's not up to, up to uh, snuff, um, it's just further loss of height on top of what you already have to deal with that you're trying to improve with growth hormone. So there's, there's another issue with the height. Um, so how do we treat it? It's really, really straightforward. Unlike my other life with kids with diabetes, where they're pricking their fingers you know, four to six times a day and giving shots before every meal and a very complicated life, basically taking a tablet of levothyroxine, that's T4, uh, that uh, once a day is pretty much 99% of the time all it takes to, to, uh, to easily fix this. In fact, thyroxine has such a long half-life in the blood, if you miss a tablet one day, you're fine. I, this is a struggle I have with kids, and I actually forgot to put on this slide. I really, really encourage all, all my girls, well, every, all my kids with hypothyroidism, but Turner girls in, per, in particular, to get one of those cheap little 99-cent pill dispensers because if you wake up on Saturday this morning and you have Friday's pill is still in the box that you didn't take it, you can double up. You can take multiple, not, not a week's worth, but two or three days you can double up on. The one thing for those of you who are taking thyroxine, I hope you know, you can't take it at the same time as you take iron because the iron binds up the thyroid medicine and you don't get the proper dose. You may think you're taking 100 micrograms and then what you swallow it with some iron, you might be getting 50. So your, your, your blood tests were going to get off. Yes? So if I take it with my multivitamin that has iron in the morning, that's not good? Well, multivites are not the same. So I would say even at that, I would, if you could do them at different times of the day or at least a few hours apart, <laughs> that would be better. But I'm talking more when someone says, oh, you're anemic, I'm going to put you on some iron like a, a thing called ferrosol or ferrous sulfate, those kinds of things. That's heavy-duty iron treatment. That is going to mess this up. But I, I don't think the amount that's in a, in a, a multivite, you know, like a one-a-day or something with iron, is necessarily going to, going to do it. The thing is, too, if you always do it then, if you always take them together, when you have your blood work, you know, if, if, the, if the doctor needs to make an adjustment, okay, we're going to go up, it's, it's going to become like not a variable thing. It's only if you, if you, somebody puts you on iron for a few weeks and then suddenly you're, like your levels will, will fall apart and then, then you stop taking the iron and everything's different again. You, you see what I'm saying? It's, if, you're, if you do this regularly, you're fine. Yeah. You're fine. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I hear that, too. I, I deal with kids. You, you can't do that. The thing is to be consistent. If you take it with breakfast, you're fine. There's, there's some warnings about soy. A lot of soy can bind uh, thyroxine, too, like if you take a lot of soy. But 
as long as you do it the same way every day, you go in for your test, they say, hey, you know, we need to adjust it up or down a little, you're going to take care of that. You just don't want to have it be something that constantly changes, that one day you're taking, you know, for a week you take it on an empty stomach. I know they say that, but that's, that's pharmacists talking, and, and it's not real-world people. The key is to take your pill every day. Get yourself one of those little dispensers and don't miss a dose, and you can take two or three at a time. I'll come back to you in a second. Let me, yes? That's not iron, though, right? What, what do you take for your thalassemia? Uh, folic acid. Folic acid, yeah, no, not an issue, not an issue at all. It's the iron in particular. Iron uh, and some other heavy metals like magnesium can bind iron, but, but that folic acid is not a problem. Somebody... Calcium. Calcium, too, yeah. Do you take your calcium every day? Just do what you're doing. <laughs> just take, you know, it'll. It, just don't change it though. Don't don't one day no or now for some prolonged period of time, take them separately and then because it'll mess up the levels. Once you once you're into a routine, the blood test will will all always show like okay this is we've got it balanced right. Again, what happens is the thyroid hormone binds to calcium not so much as iron, not so much as to magnesium, but it can affect the levels. But unless you're on huge levels of calcium. I mean, is this just like a, no, don't worry about it. And don't tell your doctor I said that. But <laughs> There was somebody over here, no? Okay. All right, so um, the pills, uh, you, those of you, um, I, I obviously know this, the pills are color-coded. I, there's so much pressure to get people off of brand-name drugs. I insist on brand-name drugs for children, small children. The issue with generics is they're fine, but the issue is one generic to another, the manufacturing processes are slightly different, and it's very possible that you get different batches of drug made by a different drug company, and their potency is different. It might say 88 micrograms on the pill, and in one batch it might be 82, it might be 95 in another one. I mean, that's, that's how much tolerance there is in the strength of these things, but it's not so important if you're taking like 100 if you're taking, you know, uh, 300 micrograms of thyroxin, it is if you're taking like 25 and you're, and you're a, you know, a two-year-old or a, 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 an infant. So I, I generally, for little kids, will say, like, let's pick one brand-name drug and stick with it because I know the potency will be pretty consistent. Generics are absolutely fine in my mind the farther out you go. Um, and and the way, so how do we know when you've got the right amount of thyroxin? It's just going back to that furnace thing. It's just when the levels in the blood get appropriate to turn off your TSH, to bring it down to the normal range, that's the dose we aim for. Some people will argue it should be in the upper part of the, lower range, the normal range, the middle of the lower range. For, for the most part, there's, some, there's a loud, loud group that says, I feel better when it's in the upper end of normal. But you don't want the TSH to be suppressed because if you take too much thyroid hormone, you'll get osteoporosis. It'll, it'll, it's a long story, but it'll help. It'll encourage calcium loss from your bones. You want to keep it in the normal range. We rarely use, although there's a lot of kind of popular interest, you'll find websites that say, oh, those doctors don't know what they're talking about. You should not take thyroxin. You should take Cytomel, which is T3, or combinations of T4 or T3, or you should take ground-up thyroid, ground-up cow thyroid gland extracts, which is how they treated it in the 1920s. I, I'm not, not a favor of any of these, uh, and this has been pretty much debunked. If you use T4, the body converts it appropriately. Yes? My thyroid level has been a little normal. Which, which, le which level, though? The TSH or the, or the T4? T4, I think. Low normal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, what about your TSH, though? Um, I think it's like 120. Mm -hmm. But I think it's like talk to them, talk to her, and say like 112, the next pill up is 100, there's a, I think there's a 118 and a 125. Pick a slightly higher version, go a couple of months with that and see what it does to the blood work. You don't want the TSH to go below normal though. There's a bottom end to that. That's going to cause you long-term problems with your bones, but there, there's no harm in playing with this a little bit. Can it cause sweating? No. Hypothyroid doesn't cause sweating? No. 
if you have Graves' disease, you sweat. That's a whole different. That's the where the the gland is like super overactive. That's not what you're dealing with. Just taking thyroxine doesn't do that. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. The only time, um, and actually a lot of endocrinologists don't know this, but because this may be more of a pediatric thing, if you are very profoundly hypothyroid, if your TSH is like 150, normal is between like 0.5 and 4 or something like that, so if you're 15 or 20 or 40, you've take, you come off and it's like in that range, it's fine to start back. If your TSH is really high in the multiple hundreds, I, I will always start someone on half the dose for about two or three weeks and then go to the full dose. It can cause some problems with brain, brain swelling. So that, but for the most part, nobody works in that range. You know, that's, that's really, really hypothyroid, so. Okay, there was another hand. Yes, back there. That's for the most part, yes. Now, did they measure the free T4 as well? Some, some don't. No, it's it, for the most part. What, whatever there are, ty- the most sensitive way to monitor thyroid function is the TSH. The free T4 assay that is used in commercial labs, the ones you send out to Quest or LabCorp or even. Vanderbilt Children's Hospital uses, is not as accurate. There's another way to measure free T4 that's very expensive, very labor-intensive, and we rarely, rarely do. It's, it's, a, it's not as accurate in determining your thyroid status as the TSH is. So when they say, like, that if the TSH is good, we're good to go, I would stick with that. There are people who have hypothyroidism not because there's a problem with their thyroid, but their pituitary gland is, is defective. That, I see a lot of that. Kids who've had brain tumors, we don't measure the TSH in them because that's what the problem is. They don't make TSH. We have to rely on the free T4. And I, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm working in the dark, you know, working using those levels, but that's all you can use. You can't use the TSH. So for the most part, the TSH is, is by far the more sensitive of the indicators of your thyroid health. Yes? Yeah, so this is about, yeah, this is, this is definitely uh, adult stuff. So the business about the ratio of the T4 and the T3 is important. Um, there was a psychiatrist in North Carolina about 30 years ago that rose, raised this question. If you gave somebody T4, in some people, it just doesn't distribute itself right between the T3 and the T4 and all that stuff. That's been really pretty much debunked. Now, estrogen pills, this is important. When there are all my all my girls, Turners or otherwise, uh, uh, hear this from me over and over, um, estrogen has a major effect on how much thyroid hormone you need because when you take when your estrogen levels go up, either because you're taking a birth control pill or you're pregnant or uh, you're going through puberty. You know, you're 10 and now you're 12 and now you're 14. Your estrogen levels have gone up dramatically your thyroid hormone production has to increase substantially. In other words, there, there are binding proteins that are, that are made in the liver, but the, your estrogens determine that, how much binding protein. They go up. They go up in women, and this is a, woman, a girl thing. In men, they actually go down slightly because andro- testosterone makes them go down. But as the binding proteins go up, you have to take more thyroxine to get the proper level to, to shut off the TSH production. So estrogen is really important. I, I caution girls, you know, the fact that you've outgrown this dose, now you're 12, there, there's a lot of puberty stuff going on. In Turner syndrome, when we put someone on a, on a patch or other kind of estrogen replacement, 
I, I'm, I'm saying, hey, next time we're going to recheck your thyroid, maybe a little sooner than we would have otherwise, because your thyroid dose may need to change. Or you might have not been th- hypothyroid until now, and it might show up when your body, ha- your thyroid has to produce more. So that's the connection with estrogens. Pregnancy, birth control pills, est- est- outside estrogen patches or other forms, and then puberty. Okay. Um, okay, so let's just, uh, we, we've kind of addressed some of this stuff. Uh, what causes the thyroid gland to fail? I, I alluded to this one. I'm not going to say anything about this. When you have a pituitary gland problem, which is not an issue in, in Turner girls, um, you develop what's called secondary hypothyroidism. The, the, the furnace is working fine. The thermostat is broken. And those people have to be treated, uh, and you can't rely on the TSH. Now, the, by far the more common one is when the gland itself is having a problem that's called primary hypothyroidism. And there are a bunch of things, but the common one is down here. But let me just kind of go through this because other people may have, other people you know may have had some of these things. There are kids born without a thyroid gland, and that's why we do the newborn screening. Some people have very rare, um, their thyroid gland is a tiny little nub and like about a tenth of what it ought to be on the back of their tongue. It's called a lingual thyroid. That's kind of a developmental defect. And that eventually kind of gives out and you become hypothyroid. We talked about iodine deficiency in Africa. Um, There are certain drugs. People who take lithium have to have their thyroid levels monitored often because that messes up thyroid hormone production in the gland. If you have to take this heart pill, amiodarone, that's got a ton of iodine in it. It messes up your thyroid function. Now, this one, every kid in the room will like this because there are certain things like Brussels sprouts and kale and cabbage that are considered goitrogens. There's there's chemicals in there that interfere with thyroid hormone production. You have to eat such a ton of this kind of stuff to get that that I would stop worrying about this. Where where you see this is like Eastern Europe, like Germany, Czechoslovakia during World War II where all people had to eat was like field greens like this and there was some hypothyroidism. So let's get to the more important things. Inflammation of the thyroid. And that's what Hashimoto's is. Now, before we get to Hashimoto's, you can have bacteria get into your thyroid, and cause, that's very tender, very swollen. It gets red. You get a fever. You can get tuberculosis. You can get parasites. I'm not going to show you pictures of that. That's, and that's not something I've ever seen, the parasites. But you can get TB in your thyroid. There's all sorts of reasons it can be damaged. You can get viral infections. Those also tend to be very painful uh, in large thyroids. If you have neck irradiation, we don't do this anymore, but it used to be anybody who grew up in the 40s and 50s, and I think this ended somewhere around the 1960s, it was very common to use irradiation of the face to treat teenagers with acne. It was common to treat babies who had a big thymus gland, which is in your chest, with a big dose of radiation to make it shrink. There's no reason you'd ever want to shrink a thymus, but this is something they did in the 40s. And what happens is, if you're aiming at the face, if you're aiming at the chest, the thyroid's right in the middle, and it gets a blast of radiation. Not only is it more prone to develop thyroid cancer later, but it can become underactive. That's less common, but there are still places where people have been exposed to radiation. Well, so I take care of a number of children who have cancers of the, the mouth and throat. Like the, uh, the palate, there, there, there are what are leiomyosarcomas or smooth, smooth, smooth muscle cancers of the throat. They have to irradiate those, and there's no way the thyroid doesn't get blasted in there. And a lot of those kids develop underactive thyroid. These are all really rare. Everything from here up is rare. The big one is autoimmune thyroiditis, also called Hashimoto's. So autoimmunity, this is the big picture here. It's a misdirected immune response. Our immune system is normally there to help us fight off invaders, right? Things that shouldn't be in the body, uh, germs of various sorts, bacteria, viruses, fungus. But in this case, the immune response attacks cells in the patient's own body. You somehow don't recognize that this is your thyroid cell, and you make antibodies against it, which leads to its destruction. So these antibodies, there's, there's, they're white blood cells that are called lymphocytes that make antibodies. They're called B cells. They, these antibodies help another class of cells that are called T cells become activated. They, they use the antibodies to home in on a particular organ and they destroy it. And that's what Hashimoto's is. So the important thing to remember about this is that if you have one autoimmune disease, let's say you've got Hashimoto's, you are more likely at some point in your life to develop another different autoimmune disease on top of that. And I'll show you exactly some, some data about that. 
Does that make sense? You often isn't lim- limited. By far the most common one of all is hy- hypothi- autoimmune hypothyroidism. Hashimoto lived in the 1800s. He had no idea what he, he described a bunch of Japanese people with goiters and they turn out that's, that's what they have. It's autoimmune thyroiditis, but he had no idea about that. They couldn't measure antibodies. And yes. So when you, when you say you may have the propensity to develop other autoimmune, that arthritis? I'll show you a list. I'll show, I got a list for you. I'll show you a list. Yes. The actual levels of the so the question is, do the antibody levels change? That the fact that they're there is enough to indicate that there's thyroiditis. The levels that they're at can be highly variable in people. If you don't have it, it's very unlikely that you'll get autoimmune thyroid problems. They they precede the disease. I'll show you more about that, how it happens in type one diabetes, because that that we have a little bit more information on that. Okay, so just a quick picture here. Here's a normal thyroid gland here under the microscope. These big lakes here are called colloid lakes. Um, that's what a normal thyroid looks like. This is a gland. It's a little bit, this is a little bit more magnified. So see those round spaces there? So we, we have to blow this up a little. But I hope you can see all those little black dots in there. That, those are lymphocytes that are kind of chewing away at the um, thyroid tissue, kind of like little Pac-Man here. Those are effector T cells, or T lymphocytes. That's what's doing all this trouble. Now, they can be there for years before you actually have enough damage done that you're going to need to treat it. You can't, treating someone with thyroxin only because they have antibodies does not do anything. There are still some doctors that do that. There's no rationale for that. But again, just to point out that there are these antibodies, this, these are B cells. It's a little cartoon of B cells, but there's an antibody. The antibodies from there say, like, there's something going on in this thyroid that leads from there to here that attract the antibodies kind of bind to places here. These guys come in after the antibodies cause damage. Okay? So, Hashimoto's, this is just in the normal, the, pop, the usual population that's found in about almost 1.5% of kids and teenagers. That's the peak year. But in young women, women it's like, in, in adolescence, it's 2 to 1 girls to boys. In older Older in adults, 10 to 1. It's a female disease. Not to say men don't get it, but it's by far overwhelmingly a female disease. The peak incidence is around puberty, but women will be diagnosed with this when they're in their 20s, 30s, 40s, not in their 80s and 90s. Now, the other interesting thing, the populations that are most at risk for this, we know that Turner syndrome is, but Klinefelter syndrome, these are men with an extra uh, 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 X chromosome in Down syndrome, for Down syndrome population very commonly have the same issues with thyroid that, that we see with Turner's. And what you see is these lymphocytes infiltrating the thyroid. So this point here, Hashimoto thyroiditis, that diagnosis means that you have lymphocytes in your thyroid. We rarely biopsy them to show it that way. It means you have antibodies against thyroid in your blood, but it doesn't always imply hypothyroidism. Right? Hypothyroidism is when your TSH goes up. So you can have Hashimoto thyroiditis and it doesn't need treatment. There's no way to treat it. I mean, there is. You could block your whole immune system and then you'd, it's like having AIDS. You, you don't want to do that. So, but there's no reason to treat that. But they don't always go together. You can have smoldering thyroiditis for years or decades and never need to go on treatment for it. And we've talked about that point as well. Now, here's an interesting graph. I think somebody asked about this one earlier. This is in Denmark. They looked at Turner women. It's not a huge number. Um, most of them were 45X. Some were uh, mosaic Turner. But basically, we're looking at different age groups. So this is 0 to 10, 10 to 20, to 30, to 40, to 50, to 60, and over 60 years old there. And they looked for three different kinds of antibodies. One was the thyroid antibodies. One was celiac antibodies. And the other was the antibodies that are part of the type 1 diabetes, juvenile diabetes. So it just says what percentage of people in these groups, age groups, developed any combination of those antibodies. And the message that I want you to see is not so common in little ones, but it's getting around puberty. We talked about how this is a puberty onset thing for the most part. Um, and going out to, um, to adulthood, you keep getting more and more 
antibodies. Autoimmunity kind of continues to happen as you get older, which means you've got to be monitored for these things. There isn't an antibody measurement for every disease that, that, um, that is autoimmune, but for the ones that are, in particular celiac and thyroid, which are the two more common, and for type 1 diabetes, there are, there are ways to monitor it. But again, the older you get, you, this process keeps going. All right, here's a list. This is also from Denmark. Just a listing of diseases here, and in their, in their particular study, again, which was not huge, it was much bigger than that one I showed you, Here's the disease, and I, I know it's impossible to read, so I'll, I'll go through this. This column is how much increased it is over the regular population. So everybody gets autoimmune hemolytic anemia. But if you've got Turner syndrome, I mean, not everybody. It's in the general population. But if you've got Turner syndrome, you're about 14 times higher risk for that happening than if than not. Uh, alopecia areata, where you get these patches of, of um, hair loss, big circles, not, not just diffuse hair loss. 20 times higher in Turner syndrome women. Celiac disease, about 14 times. Crohn's disease, a disease of the, of the small intestine, that's uh, five times higher. I'll come back to this in a minute. Uh, ulcerative colitis, about four times. Rheumatoid arthritis, about double the risk. Let's stick with the ones we're talking about. Hashimoto's thyroiditis, presence of antibodies in your blood, it's about 12 times higher in the Turner group population than, than the rest of the, the population. The ones that actually become hypothyroid, it's not all of the, the ones with thyroiditis, but it's about nine times higher. That's, that's why we, we screen every year. The, the risk of developing the overactive thyroid is about five times higher. And let me just point out this one because we're going to come back to this in a minute as a, an interesting kind of example of what can happen in, in Turner's. Type 1 or juvenile diabetes, it's about eight times higher. So that's, that's the spectrum of things. Pretty much anything, you, psoriasis, pernicious anemia, and there are others that aren't on here. Just As you can see, I kind of ran out of room here. But um, at Turner syndrome women have a propensity to autoimmunity. The number one autoimmune thing that they tend to get uh, of, a, of a glandular nature is the thyroid uh, type 1 diabetes for the most part. Celiac, where's celiac on here? I know it's not. Oh, there, there it is, yeah, 14 times higher. And... There are handouts back there. This kind of lists what organs these things happen in. All right, let me just finish, because uh, so, I'm sure there are going to be more questions. Just a little bit of exciting stuff that's going on with preventing, a type one, preventing type 1 diabetes, which is an autoimmune disease. So let me ask, how many people in this room have a personal family connection to type 1 diabetes? Ah, just as I expected. Okay, Not, it's about half the hands that were raised with the thyroid, but... Um, so let me, let me tell you about this. Diabetes is a condition where you have too high a level, yes, yes, thank you, of glucose in your blood, right? For, there's two major ways this happens. So there's a blood vessel. Those little spots are, are glucose levels. Insulin is really important for this. Insulin is what opens up your cells. I'm simplifying a lot, but insulin is required to get glucose out of the blood into your cells, and then you get nice happy cells, right? That's normal life. Now, that's a pancreas over there, and that's the beta cell in the pancreas. That's where insulin is made. And so I, I, found, I got a little model of a locksmith there because the locksmith makes the, lock, the key, the key opens up the cells, and that, that's what we've got. When you develop diabetes, there's two ways this can happen. 95% of diabetes is not the type 1. It's type 2 diabetes. This is the one that we see in older people, Certain ethnic groups, like Pima Indians, like it's huge, like 45, 50% of them get type 2 diabetes. They make lots of insulin. It's just like somebody changed the lock. Insulin doesn't work well. They become less sensitive to their own insulin, and they develop high blood sugar because of uh, the, well, it's, it's more than just the obesity, but that contributes a lot to it. Type 2 diabetes you can often control with lifestyle, pills, diet, that kind of stuff. Type 1 is different. This is the one that's like and is related to Hashimoto's. The problem is, so there, that's your pancreas aflame. Um, that's your immune system. This little Pac-Man guy has gotten in, and, and the target now isn't the thyroid. It's the beta cells in the pancreas. You don't make insulin. The keys are gone. So glucose can't get into cells, and you get quite sick from that. I don't want to go off too much on this, but it's about 5% of all people with diabetes. In my world, we have almost 3,000 children here that we see with diabetes. 85% of them have type 1. Yeah, and that's the one that's, you can't tell them, you know, get more active. I mean, we tell them that too, but 
you know, watch your diet, do this, that, that won't make it go away. It's their immune system has called the problem. So here, here's a fact that we really don't have a good handle on. This is 1950. This goes up to, I think, 2010. Um, in Finland, it's a very common disease. Prevalence in Finland is much higher than anywhere else. But here's Colorado. Anybody that's looked at it, about five, 3 to 5% per year increase in the, the, the rate of new cases of type 1 diabetes. And un, unfortunately, it tends to be what we've seen lately is more in toddlers than in older kids. Type 1 diabetes usually hits around between ages 10 and 15, but you can see it in 50-year-olds. It's autoimmune diabetes, exactly like we talked about with the thyroid. There's a lot of points on here. Let me just show you just a couple key points. That is a, an islet. That's where insulin is made. Beta cells are inside that islet in the pancreas. These, these darker purple things are the other part of the pancreas that makes digestive enzymes. But you see what's happened to that islet there? You see all, Those are little black Pac-Men in there chewing up the thyroid. Those are T lymphocytes that are destroying the islet. Exactly what happens in Hashimoto's happens in type 1 diabetes. So as we see this... Beta cell mass refers to how much insulin you can make. You're fine. This is what you're born with. I, I can't get into this now, but there are, we think there are triggers maybe that are from the environment that start this process off. You get the antibodies, and for a while, you have antibodies there, but normal blood sugars. And then you start damaging pancreas more and more, and eventually you get abnormal blood sugars. And then finally, when, you're, when your pancreas is down to about 30% of what it used to be able to make, they can't make insulin anymore. So there's been a big interest in in um, preventing type 1 diabetes. It's a huge... For those of you who live with it, I don't have to tell you anymore. It's just I, some of the coolest people I know and the coolest families I know struggle with this, and they do really well with it, but there are a lot of people who just flounder with this. The National Institutes of Health started a program called TrialNet. The mission is to prevent type 1 diabetes before it starts and to stop the disease from progressing. So they're... The, the goal, again, is to find people who are at risk to develop type 1 diabetes before they have blood sugar problems. That means they have antibodies. And then um, try. We don't, have a, we don't have a proven way yet to, to prevent it, but we've, we're making some progress. So let me show you, actually go back one slide here. We now think of type 1 diabetes, that's, that's a graph I showed you, as happening in, three, happening in three stages. It used to be when you got sick, when you had high blood sugars, when you had to be hospitalized, you were drinking and peeing. Oh, I'll be done in just a minute. Um, you, that's called, we now call that stage three. But we know that people that have just the antibodies, way up here, they're, they're going, 100% of those people are going to go on to get diabetes, 100%. So we call that stage one. Stage two is when they have abnormal blood sugars, and stage three is when you're at the point where you actually need insulin to treat it. So there's, there's a network of places um, that's us here. There's a couple in the Northeast. There, there's a website I can help you with um, to identify a place near you. But what's going on, if you have a relative with type 1 diabetes, so to, to be in trial, you have to be related to someone. Just having Turner syndrome is not enough. There has to be some family member, blood relative, that has type 1 diabetes. Uh, but you're roughly at about 15 times the risk for developing the disease. That means like about a 1 in 25% risk versus a 1 in 240% chance. 15 times higher risk of getting it if you, um, if you have a family member. There is a way through TrialNet that does not involve, it's free. It does not involve your insurance company knowing anything about it. Um, it's, it's funded by the NIH. We pay for it in our tax dollars. But you can have a screening test to see if you have these antibodies. If we have a prevention trial going on that you would be eligible for, we'll, we'll tell you about it. And you can do this anywhere in the country. But we can help you kind of get into the system if you're, if you're interested. I'm going to skip over this. What's involved, we would confirm your eligibility. We don't want to know who's got type 1 diabetes. Actually, with the one point in this past back slide here, if you're young, up to age 20, it can be any blood relative. If you're 21 to 45, it has to be either your parent, your child, or your sibling who has type 1 that would make you eligible to be in the study. But... That identifies people with antibodies. One last thing. This made a big splash about two weeks ago. This is a girl named Kirby. She's got an identical twin with type 1 diabetes. Her chances of getting the disease are 65% over her lifetime, and she actually did get diabetes. She was in a study looking at a drug, and I won't tell you more. It kind of prevents the activation of those T cells that was just published like two weeks ago in the New England Journal of Medicine. But here's what we found. A treatment... Let me just go to this graph right here. A treatment 
with this drug called teplizumab resulted in a two-year delay in the development of type 1 diabetes and people who were at that stage 2. They were at very high risk. In other words, 85% of those people would go on to develop diabetes within five years. This is the group that got placebo. And you can see at the end of five years, which is here, we are at like 90% of them have already gotten diabetes. Whereas the group that got treated with the drug, they still went on to get diabetes. But what, what we learned was we delayed it. Like half of, half of the placebo group got diabetes by about 24 months. Half of the treated group got diabetes not till they were 48 months. We delayed it by two years. At the end of the study, and this is the last study, 25 people in the treated group, there were equal numbers, were not, did not have diabetes. Only nine in this group did not have diabetes. This is really exciting. It's, it's not a home run. It's like a double. Maybe it's a single even. But we're working very hard on this to, to maneuver this to, like, can we take people who are just have the antibodies and keep them from getting type 1 diabetes? Oh, I'm going backwards here. And so I think I'm going to conclude here. Um, type 1 diabetes is a whole different life risk than Hashimoto's thyroiditis. I'm talking to you about this because I know among you, you've proven to me, among you are people with type 1 diabetes risk. If you're interested, you, you might want to talk about this. But there's no way anyone would think about giving you immune-suppressing drugs to stop your Hashimoto's thyroiditis. It's, if your thyroid gets damaged, you take a pill, and you're, for the most part, quite healthy. I'm going to stop. I have one more picture to show you, and I want to see if this is a quiz. All right, here's a class from North Carolina. Uh, I can't remember what grade this is. Can anyone in the front row identify who's got hypothyroidism in this picture? The boy in the brown, yeah. This is the guy who's wearing gloves, who's got a heavy leather jacket on. Yeah, he's cold. Look at his face. Look at his face compared to the other kids in the class. Okay, you're paying attention. You pass. Thank you. Thank you very much.